Welcome back to lesson 13 on our studies of 1st and 2nd Peter. We're in the book of 2nd Peter right now. Last week we talked about uh, the inspiration of the Word and the importance of inspiration. Uh, inspiration slash preservation. Without no preservation, there is no inspiration. Uh, if only the original manuscripts were inspired and nobody has original manuscripts and nobody has the Bible today. And of course God said that not one jot or one tittle would pass away and that God would preserve his word. And so we don't have to worry about whether we have the Bible or not. Uh, God is an all-powerful God. God surely can preserve his word for us today. Peter, in 2 Peter 1.19, said... We also have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And of course what Peter is referring to is that his personal experience there of um, Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration passage, where uh, him, James, and John uh, saw Elijah and Moses come down, saw Jesus transformed. And he talked about the personal experience that he had at that great event and how amazing that was. But he said when it comes down to it, what's even more amazing is that we have a more short word of prophecy. We have the inspired, preserved word of God. Paul talks about the same thing in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 when he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed, God inspired His Word, and it's profitable for every area of our life, for doctrine, reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we have all that we need. We have all the Bible that we need. There is no more Bible to be uh, given to us. Uh, there's no more... Uh, new inspiration in regards to the Word of God. The last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, talks about not adding to the, the Word or, nor taking away from the Word of God. And so we have the complete Word of God. 1 Corinthians 13 uh, says, When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. And of course, the word perfect means complete. And so it so when the Bible is complete then the temporary sign gifts that were given, the gift of languages, the gift of healing, uh, those uh, of, of the prophecy, those things were done away with because we have everything that we need in the complete Word of God. And so we can rest assured that we have everything that, that we can possibly need in regards to the Scriptures. And here Peter, again, witnessed the transfiguration, but he declared that the Word of God is far greater confirmation. Uh, we don't need signs and we don't need wonders today. We don't need uh, visions or dreams because we have a greater confirmation. I mean, if we had to rely upon dreams today, we'd have to rely upon prophets and we'd have to rely upon people who come and say that they're of God. And are they? I mean, how, how would we know? Uh, and so... We have the greater confirmation in that we have the, the complete Word of God. Nothing can change that. Uh, no uh, preacher, no uh, so-called prophet is going to change. Anybody who goes against the Word of God, Deuteronomy talks about, I think it's 13 and 18, chapter 13, chapter 18, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that if a prophet comes and uh, says something contrary to the Word of God, then he's to be stoned to death. Or if he says something and it comes to pass and it's contrary to the Word of God, he's still to be stoned to death. I mean, uh, so just because somebody comes up and predicts something in the future doesn't mean they're of God. We have to go back to the Word of God. That's, that's the basis, that's the foundation. And if you read it in the Bible, that's what it says. And uh, 10,000 people tell you that it's wrong, they're wrong because the Bible is secure. We have that greater confirmation that the Word of God is 
the word of God. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. And we have also a more sure word of prophecy that you do well, that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So a more sure word of prophecy. Better than any vision or dream that we can possibly uh, uh, hear about or maybe even personally experience. You know, a, somebody brought a book in one day written supposedly by a little boy who uh, was written by his parents, but they said this little boy uh, uh, went to heaven and uh, God told him all these different things. And in the book, uh, and <laughs> I think the guy's, the boy's last name was Malarkey, if, if that's the same book. I saw a couple of different books. Uh, but the uh, boy said that uh, God showed him the tribulation period and he saw his father, who was a uh, pastor, uh, fighting in the tribulation period. Uh, well, that goes contrary. If the, the boy's father is a pastor and he truly is, is saved, he won't be in the tribulation period. He'll have been raptured out. So that goes contrary to it. Another uh, person brought a book in where this woman said that Jesus took her to hell. And while she was in hell, she witnessed all these different events. And she saw Satan sitting on his throne, uh, commanding people to come entertain him and morphing them into different creatures. Well, first of all, Satan has never been to hell, and he won't go there to the lake of fire after the end of the millennial kingdom. And when he gets there, he will not be ruling the place. Uh, so, you know, it goes contrary to the scriptures. So, is that book true? No, it's a blatant, outright lie of the devil. Uh, people who say they died on the operating table and they uh, see a bright light. Honestly, th that happened to me. It, it did happen to me back in December the 15th of 1982. Now, I remember December 15th because it was my birthday. I had hernia surgery. And when they gave me the medication, the anesthesia, and took me down the hallway into the operating room, while I was in there, I saw a bright light. Uh, I did. I, I saw a bright light. And I heard voices, and I heard moaning. And uh, uh, when I was coming out of the anesthesia, what happened was the moaning I heard was me because they were cutting them. I felt them with a knife make the incision, and the bright lights and the voices, the bright lights were the operating room lights, and the voices were the doctors and nurses. They were, they were saying, give him more anesthesia. He's coming out of it. And they gave him more anesthesia. I went out and then woke up in, in uh, uh, the, the room they assigned me. And so what people probably is going on with these people said they die and go to heaven. But the one thing that you're thinking about for a lot of people when they go into the operating room is they're going to die. And if they die, where are they going? Well, they all seem to go to heaven, it seems like. Uh, and, uh, but they say they hear voices and they see the bright lights, and they go to the light, and they see their grandmother, or they see whoever it might be in heaven. Well, the anesthesia they give you is a non hallucinogenic. I mean, it, it does cause you to dream. And while you're in the anesthesia there, you're thinking about your loved ones, you're thinking about going to heaven, and so that's all that they, they see. Because what they always say is contrary to the Word of God. And so... No, I don't believe people die and go to heaven. People say, well, I died twice on the operating room table. No, no, you didn't. You, you didn't die twice. Your heart may have stopped, but that doesn't mean you're dead. I mean, they've shown evidence of uh, people falling into frozen uh, ice water, uh, into frozen lakes, and be underwater for several minutes, up to 10, 20 minutes, I believe I heard one time. And what happens is the body just kind of shuts down. It's still alive, but it doesn't need the oxygen because of the cold uh, water. You don't have to breathe like that. Now they have to be resuscitated and all that. But do they die? No. That's, dead is when you don't come back. Uh, when you quit breathing for a, a little while, doesn't mean that you're dead. When your heart stops, it doesn't mean that you're dead. 
That's just what the doctors say is that they die. The doctors don't know. Right? So these people have these so-called out-of-body experiences or whatever it might be. It's their dreams. It's their imagination. And was it real to them? Absolutely. It, it absolutely was real to them. But I'm not going to base my relationship with Jesus Christ over what somebody dreamed about. I can base my relationship with Jesus Christ on the written, finished, complete, preserved Word of God. The word interpretation is used a lot in Christianity. People talk about, you know, what's your inter how do you interpret this passage or interpret that passage? And the Bible is very clear that knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. See, if the Bible was up to private interpretation, then how I interpret the Bible would be one way, and how you interpret the Bible would be a different way, and how somebody else would interpret the Bible would be a different way. And therefore you'd have a multitude of interpretations, and, and can they all be right? I, I'll tell you this, if the Bible does not mean, one passage mean one thing, if it can mean anything, then it means nothing. If it can mean anything you want it to mean, then it means absolutely nothing. Because you, one day you might feel like this way, and one day you might feel like that way, and you read the same passage. And so if it can just mean anything that there is, then what good is it? I mean, God understands languages. He's the one who gave us language. In fact, I believe God gave us language, not so that we can communicate with each other so much. That's the secondary purpose. The first purpose is so that He can communicate to us. And so he obviously understands language. He says what he means. He means what he says. He uses the vernacular of the times. And so we have to look at the Bible from a historical grammatical viewpoint to find out what that passage is talking about. But it always means the same thing. Now, you might apply it to your day a little bit differently somehow, but it always goes back to meaning the exact same thing. There... It's important to note that no single verse in the Bible can be understood apart from the remaining 31,172 verses. So, you can't go to Genesis and find a verse and go to the book of Revelation and find a verse and say that they contradict each other. They, they don't contradict. You have to read everything, and very importantly, when it comes to studying the Bible, context is everything. To take the Bible in proper context. You can take one verse and just part of a verse and make it seem like some strange doctrine. But you have to compare every verse with every verse. All 1189 chapters, all 66 books of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. You compare both together, the passages together, and you can understand the Bible. Someone once said, I don't know who it was, said the best commentary for the Bible is the Bible. So you have to compare the book of Daniel with the book of Revelation. They go hand in hand. Daniel gives us understanding of the book of Revelation. If you just read the book of Revelation, you, it may be more confusing until you go back to Daniel and find out what God talked about there. You may have to go to Zechariah in order to understand. You may have to go to Isaiah or to Ezekiel to understand everything. But the Bible, you compare every verse together. If you take the verses out of context, you can come up with any doctrine that you want. In 1 Corinthians 15, 29, it says, uh, uh, not that verse. Oh, we don't have it up there. Uh, let, me, let me read the verse to you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Bear with me one second. I thought I had the verse up there, and apparently I don't. But taking the verse by itself, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, and not comparing it to other scripture can on the surface seem to be a little bit confusing. It says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? 
Now you have religions like Mormonism who teaches that proxy baptism, that I can be baptized for someone else. Uh, I like to do my genealogies, and I, I use different programs to, to go back and find uh, uh, my ancestors, what have you. But the, the program I use is actually owned by the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I was noticing one day, one of my ancestors that had died, I think, I can't remember the year, but it seemed like it might have been the 1500s, 1600s. And uh, they said he was born on this day, that he died on this day, and he was baptized on this day. He was born, say, let's say 1500, he died in 1560, and he was baptized in 1982. <laughs> I'm thinking, how did that work? Well, the way it worked for the Mormon church is that some ancestor of his decided to go to the Mormon church and pay a certain fee and be baptized in his place. And, and proxy baptism. So now this guy, uh, even though he died in the 1500s, got baptized in 1982. So that means he makes it to the next world for Mormonism, whatever that might be. Well, that's ridiculous. The Bible doesn't teach that. So what does it mean when it says, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Well, remember what the word baptism means. Okay, The word baptism means immersion or so what does immersion mean? It means to place into. Right? And that's the definition that we, we want to look at. So if we read it that way, else what shall they do which are placed into for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then placed into for the dead? Well, then we go to context. 1 Corinthians 15. What is that chapter talking about? So what's the passage of the Bible talking about? It's talking about the resurrection from the dead. Right? The resurrection. The argument was some people, you know, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection and that had infiltrated into the churches. And so uh, the whole point of chapter 15 is the importance of the resurrection from the dead. And so what Paul here is talking about is that being baptized for the dead or placed into for the dead, he's saying... Why do we need to replace the dead, those who died? All right. Let's say I, I'm a teacher here, all right. and while I'm alive, I'm teaching the Word of God. If I die, then what would need to take place is someone would need to be placed into the ministry for the dead, because I died. So this person takes my place because I've died. And then that person now is the teacher, and then that person dies, right? Then somebody else is placed into the ministry for that person. So what 1 Corinthians 15, 29 says, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Why is somebody placed into a ministry for someone who have died if there is no resurrection? So what's the point of a ministry continuing if there is no resurrection? If this is all that there is in this world, if that's all there is, why do we need to witness to anybody? Yeah, I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness several years ago, back in the 80s. I worked at a place, his name was Joe, and he was a, a, a Jehovah's Witness, says, uh, who had actually worked for the Watchtower publication. And so he w was in it pretty heavy. And, and I asked him one day, I said, Joe, what happens to me when I die? He said, well, you go to the grave. And I said, then what? He said, well, that's it. I said, so I, I stay in the grave? He said, well, you're, you're gone. You're not, you don't exist anymore. And I said, okay, Joe. I, I, a little bit later, I asked him, okay, Joe, what happens to you when, when you die? I said, are you one hundred forty-four thousand? He said, oh, no, 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 I'm not. Uh, he said, I met one one time, uh, it was a great guy, but I'm, I'm not one hundred forty-four thousand. And I said, well, then, will you be resurrected? He said, well, I, I, I might be, but he said, probably not. And I said, so, when you die, what happens to you then? 
He said, well, I, I go to the grave. I said, oh, okay, Job. And then that's it. He said, yeah, yeah, more than likely that's what I did. Some, Job's witness believe that uh, some of the people will be resurrected to another life, but uh, most of them would just go to the grave. And I said, okay, Job. Uh, a little bit later, I went back to Job. I said, now, let me clarify this. I said, you, when I die, I go to the grave. Yeah. I said, when you die, you just go to the grave. Yeah. And I said, so then why do I need to become a Jehovah's Witness? What's the point of it? If the same thing's going to happen. Because if you're not faithful, according to Jehovah's Witness, if you're not faithful every week to knock on doors and, and to fulfill all the plans and give money to the, uh, uh, the kingdom hall and do everything, then you're not resurrected. I said, so you're not perfect in your ways of Jehovah's Witnesses. What's, what's the point of witnessing anybody? Well, of course, he didn't have an answer for that. And, and that's what Paul here is saying, is that if there is no resurrection, why is somebody else placed into the dead, to that dead person's ministry, if that ministry has no use anyway? See, without the resurrection, there's no purpose to serve God. I mean, if we all just die and, and that's it, we're annihilated, then there is no use for Christianity. There is no reason for Jesus to have died on the cross. It makes it all worthless. So it is very important to understand that you know, a pastor of a church, a pastor of a church for 50 years, when he dies, somebody is placed into the ministry for that dead person. And then after his 50 years, somebody else is placed into the ministry for that dead person. So they're baptized, placed into, for the dead. And Paul says if there is no resurrection of the dead, then why? what's the purpose of people being, continuing the ministry? So that's what this passage is talking about. And it's not talking about me getting baptized for my dead ancestor so that dead ancestor can go to some type of a heaven. It's, it's totally ridiculous. We all are accountable for our own soul, and nobody can, can get me to heaven other than Jesus Christ. Nobody can pay the way. I heard of a nationally known preacher uh, several years ago who at one time pastored the largest Sunday school in, in the United States. 26,000, I think they said at one time. And he would always talk about his dead uh, father, who was an alcoholic, who uh, uh, died, at, I think he was a young kid at the time, whatever it was. But he, he made the statement one time that I know my father will be in heaven. Even though he talked about he, was, he died an alcoholic, he died without knowing Christ, he said, I know he'll be in heaven because of all the people I've led to the Lord. Surely God will allow him into heaven too. Well, that's, that's but frankly, it's blasphemy. It goes against the Word of God. It perverts the Word of God. Everybody's responsible for their own soul. Is there a purpose of somebody replacing somebody in the ministry? Absolutely. Because there is a resurrection. And then, baptismal regeneration cannot be taught from Acts 2.38. Uh, this is one that the, a lot of Pentecostals like to use, this, this verse here. Because taken out of context, it does seem to teach that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Taken out of context. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Hmm. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So here the church just started, and Peter's saying, You have to be baptized for the remission of sins. You have to be baptized in order for your sins to be removed. Wow, that, that is a problem, right? Well, is it? I mean, if you go to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where it says, Not by works, lest any man boast, that salvation is a free gift, then that contradicts this verse. So which one's right? Is it the free gift of salvation, or do you have to be baptized in order to have your sins removed? Well, everything in context. What is this verse talking about? Well, there's a song that we sing, kids sing, 
we sing it, Jesus loves me, this I know. Uh, and the way the song goes is, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Okay? By singing that song, how do we know Jesus loves us? Well, we know it because the Bible tells us so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Right? So, if the Bible tells us that Jesus loves us, the song says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So the word for there means what? It means because. Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Not for in order to get something, but for meaning because. And that's the problem with this verse, is that people use the wrong definition of the word for. The word for, as in Jesus loved me, the word for and because are synonyms. Right? They're synonyms. Not for in order to get, but for as in because. For the Bible tells me so. So, let's read it the right way. Right? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the remission of sins. Not in order to be forgiven, but because you are forgiven. Because you are forgiven. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, when you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, you're placed into the body of Christ, Because. Right? Not in order, but because. So we're baptized because our sins have been removed, not baptized in order to have our sins removed. Baptismal regeneration is not taught in the Bible. It is not taught in the Bible. Jesus told the thief on the cross, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. The thief, he didn't take him down off the cross and baptize him. That thief on the cross went to heaven with Jesus Christ. He went to paradise with Jesus and then immediately from there went up to heaven. Probably spent the shortest time in paradise as anybody else because in the center of the earth. He went to heaven with, with Jesus. Not because he was baptized, but because he believed. And we go to heaven not because we're baptized, but because we believe. Uh, very, very important to understand. So you have to compare all other scripture. You have to compare Acts 2.38, 1 Corinthians 15.29, with all the other verses. Here's two, so 31,170 other verses. And when you compare them together, it makes sense. But... Acts 2.38 has to agree with Acts, uh, Ephesians 2.8.9. It has to agree. And not only Ephesians 2.8.9, but numerous other verses talking about the free gift of salvation. That salvation, Abraham believed God and it was counted for righteous. So when he believed God, and when we believe God by what God says in his word, then we're saved. Not by any works that we do, but because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Peter then talks about the enemies of God. Man, there is a lot of enemies of God in this world. Uh, some enemies of God seem to be good people. Uh, I mean, nice people, polite people, who are out there teaching and preaching, uh, some, uh, sometimes even from the Bible, quoting verses from the Bible. And on the surface, they seem like uh, very legitimate uh, uh, teachers or preachers who are out there preaching the Bible, but when you really listen to what they have to say, Peter said there are pro false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So all these man-made religions out there, 
who even use the Bible as their text. Uh, let me tell you, a mark of a cult. It's easy to understand a cult if you find out they use something other than the Bible in order to prove their points. Right? Something other than the Bible, such as the Book of Mormon. Uh, they use the, the, the King James. They use King James because it's not copyrighted and they can produce it freely. Uh, they don't use the NIV because they have to pay for that. Uh, but they, they'll, they'll send you a free copy. They, they used to be on TV. Um, they may not anymore, but they used to use, uh, call them and ask for a free copy of the King James Version Bible. Uh, now you're on their mailing list, and now they're sending you all kinds of other junk, and they're also giving your name to the Mormon missionaries. They'll come knock on your door and try to convince you to convert to their uh, uh, man-made religion. Um, Mark of the cult, like Jehovah's Witnesses, they use uh, a Bible called New World Translation, but they also use all the Watchtower publications. That's what you really have to study. Uh, the Catholic Church, the Pope, is the authority over the Bible. And they use catechisms, they use other things like that. Uh, every denomination out there that uses something in addition to the Bible. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists use the writings of uh, Mary Baker, Eddie White, I think, I can't remember her name now, whatever her name was. They use her writings as their uh, final authority. They'll tell you, like Jehovah's will tell you, well, you can read the Bible, but in order to understand it, you have to read the Watchtower publications. No, you don't. In true biblical Christianity, the Bible is the sole authority of faith and practice. You don't have to read a commentary in order to understand the Bible. It might help you, but then you have to go back to the Bible to find out what the Bible actually says. Not what some uh, author has to say, but what does the Bible actually say. So, these false prophets bring in their damn little heresies, telling you you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to follow their procedure in order to be saved. Well, it's leading people to hell, damnable hell, heresies. And even denying the Lord. I mean, when they're saying you have to follow their way, it's saying that Jesus wasn't the, the way, the truth, and the life. So we have to go with, with them, uh, with uh, the Bible, rather than going with the false teachers out there. Alright, next lesson we'll look at and continue with uh, Peter's uh, re revelation of the enemies of God.